Hey, we're almost on. We'll be on live in about 15 minutes. Thank you for holding on. It's Virtual Coast Fest 2021.
Hey, good, uh, good morning. There you go. Welcome to Virtual Coast Fest 2021, coming to you live worldwide, not just here in Coastal Georgia, but worldwide from the Georgia DNR Coastal Regional Office here in Brunswick. I'm Joe Willie from 1041 The Wave, Golden Isles Broadcast. I'll be your guest host today. I'm excited to be here with Ryan and Donna of DNR's Coastal Resources Division. Ryan, tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, my name's Ryan Harrell. Um, I'm a marine biologist here with Coastal Resources Division. Um, my main job is working on our netting surveys, working with recreationally important sport fish such as red drum and spotted sea trout. Um, I've been here close to 10 years now. All right, well, Donna, yourself. Yes, my name is Donna McDowell. I've been here since 2001. I'm a marine biologist. I run the cooperative tagging program as well as the Asian Growth Laboratory, and I also run the Red Drum and Shark Long Rod Project. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. I understand that you all put together a field trip video. Let's take a look at it. Welcome to our Fish Aging Laboratory. This is where the Coastal Resources Division of the Georgia Department of Nature. Welcome to our Fish Aging Laboratory. This is where the Coastal Resources Division of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources gathers data we've collected to make the best decisions possible in managing important fish species. Effective species management helps to ensure a healthy and abundant population of recreational and commercial fish and preserves our vital ecosystem. Coastal Resources Division biologists collect, process, evaluate, and preserve the aging structures of priority fish. Aging structures are part of the fish anatomy that can be evaluated to determine the age of fish. By knowing the age of fish, scientists can estimate growth rates of a species, maximum age, age to maturity, and trends for future generations. This information can assist in determining the health and sustainability of Georgia's fisheries. The process begins with the help of anglers from across Georgia's coast. The Marine Sport Fish Carcass Recovery Project encourages anglers to deposit filleted carcasses at collection points near fish cleaning stations, marinas, and docks. Anglers place the carcasses in chest freezers, and Coastal Resources Division staff later transport them to the division's aging lab in Brunswick. Anglers have donated more than 65,000 carcasses since the project began in 1997. After each fish is identified, measured, and its sex is determined, biologists will remove a small bone called an otolith, the otolith is used to determine the age of the fish. These small bones aid fish in balance and hearing and function in a manner similar as the inner ear of humans. Otoliths are sometimes referred to as ear stones or ear bones. They are comprised of calcium carbonate and located in the fish's head behind the eye just below the brain. Every year, additional calcium carbonate material builds up within the otolith. This process results in annual bands called annuli. Annuli are comparable to the growth rings found in trees. The otoliths among species vary in shapes and sizes. Some otoliths are large and chunky like those found in red drum and black drum. Others are thin and fragile like the ones found in southern flounder and sheep's head. A seasoned marine biologist may even be able to determine the species of a fish based solely on the otolith. Coastal Resources Division biologists remove the otolith by making an incision in the fish's head. Once the otoliths are removed, they're cleaned and dried. Next, a thin section is cut from the otolith using a low-speed saw with two diamond blades. A thin section is made through the core, yielding a clear view of annuli formed within the otolith. The sections are examined under a microscope and the age observations noted. Some of the fish aged in this manner include spotted sea trout, red drum, southern kingfish, also called whiting, Atlantic croaker, triple tail, sheep's head, and southern flounder. The data collected from these specimens are used in age-based population models, estimates of species mortality rates, and longevity. This information is used in stock assessments that provide statistics and information needed to manage fisheries. It's all part of the Coastal Resources Division's mission to protect and preserve Georgia's coast for the benefit of present and future generations. What a great video. Quick reminder, you can ask questions via Facebook and YouTube. Go to Coastal GADNR on YouTube or Coast Fest on Facebook. And we want to welcome the high schoolers and the middle schoolers for being with us. And if your teacher 
is letting you watch this at school. You have the coolest teachers in the school. Thank you for being a part of it. I also want to th say thank you for the backdrop behind us, courtesy of the St. Francis Xavier School and also Needwood Middle School. They did it as an art project, and we thank you. By the way, the art contest we'll get back to next year as we um, get back to a live in-person Coast Fest. So uh, this year, of course, because of COVID, we're back to doing it virtual like we did last year. So uh, thank you all. All right, so we're waiting on questions. Anything you'd like to ask our experts, please do so. I've got a few questions. Do all fish have an otolith? Did I say that right? You did say that okay. right, yes. Um, all fish do have an otolith. Which is the ear. Yep, which okay. is the ear line. And the only ones that do not have otoliths are sharks and lampreys. So what fish has the largest otolith? Well, the ones that we work with here in our lab are red drum and red drum. They definitely have the largest. And that's the drum family are very known for having large otoliths. So, how do you tell the age of a fish? You know, with some animals, you look at their teeth, you know, with humans, we just kind of, oh, okay. But what do you do for a fish? Well, I mean, if we could ask them, that'd be much easier, <laughs> right? Because then they wouldn't have to die. But um, there are other non-lethal ways of aging a fish. Mm -hmm. So, the otolith being taken out definitely is dead. But you can also age them from scales as well as rays. All right, so we've talked a lot about the fish and the ear bone, the otolith. Can fish actually hear? Yeah, well, fish, they don't necessarily hear like we do. I mean, you, you know, but it's like Donna was saying uh, to me earlier, there's a reason you don't make a lot of noise on the boat. Mm -hmm. So fish actually hear vibrations. Okay. Um, you know, they can sense the vibrations with their otoliths. Um, also, to an extent, they can use their lateral line that runs down the side of their body to uh, sense vibrations. So when people have fish in an aquarium at home, they're not nuts for talk, talking to the fish. Absolutely not. Okay. And there's a reason the aquariums put do not tap on the glass. There you go. All right, so where do you get the fish carcasses for your program that we were seeing in the video? So uh, kind of like in, in our video, um, it explains we, uh, we have a uh, chest freezer program. Um, so we have chest freezers. I think currently we have about 19 locations. Um, they're strategically placed up and down the coast. Um, so after an angler gets done fishing, um, at the marina, they'll fillet their fish and hopefully they'll leave their heads and tails intact and the sex organs. They'll put it in a bag, um, they'll kind of give us some information about um, when they caught it, what their name is, um, and also where they caught it. Um, we're looking for generalized information, we're not looking for anybody's honey holes, but they put all that stuff into a bag, then we go and collect those fish and bring them back to our lab for processing. All right, we don't have to do a pinky swear that you won't give up the honey hole. No, we, no, okay. no, we're not giving up the honey holes. Okay, because I know some fishermen are going, oh, exactly. there's a government, I don't know about it, that. Exactly. But, uh, promise. But if you don't write clearly, okay. you can't mail you your rewards. So. Okay, you gotta get the reward. <laughs> you gotta be able to read it, yes. So what species of fish are the most abundant? I would say through our carcass program, um, our most abundant species is gonna be spotted sea trout. Um, now, like I said, uh, our previous video that you watched with the Reed Harris, if you ask those guys what's the most abundant species, they're going to tell you star drum. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we don't see those. That's not something anglers target. Um, but spotted sea trout is our number one targeted fish in coastal Georgia. Um, it's also our, our most donated fish. Right. What fish is probably the, the least common here on the coast? Um, least common is kind of a hard one to say. Um, I would say as far as our carcass program, some of the lesser donated fish would be spot, croaker, um, triple tail. Triple tail. Um, and also, you know, um, in the video you saw a red snapper on there. We do a mini season, the, the federal government does a mini season for red snapper and we collect that data um, during that mini season. Um, so we only see those for a small short time frame. So you do a lot of tagging of fish as well. Yeah, so not only do we tag as biologists, but I also have um, anglers who come to me asking if they can enter into the tagging program. And I pretty much set them up with a tagging kit that has a tagging applicator, five tags, and a, tag, um, a little instruction pamphlet. And I just kind of send them out to tag fish for me. And um, they'll, they'll give me the card back and let me know pretty much where they tagged it 
how big it was and what date they tagged it. And that way, whenever somebody calls or goes online to our website and reports that, I can also um, put all that information together and then I can create a report that I send to the angler that tagged it as well as the angler that recaptured it so that everybody knows what distance that fish traveled and how far it grew. So not only do we have yellow tag fish, we also have pink tag fish. And those fish are treated a little differently because you actually get $100 mm. for catching that fish. Everybody today will be going looking for pink <laughs> tag fish. Yes, but you got to follow the rules. So this says you have to remove that tag. So that tag has to be removed and either mailed in to me or brought to me to the office before I'm able to start that process. Okay, so I'm out fishing. I catch this certain fish. I've got the kit that you gave me. Yes. I put it on. I tag it. Yes. Throw the fish back out. Mm -hmm. And then my buddy catches it the next day or some days afterwards. And they report it as well. Yes. I had cool. one guy who actually tagged the fish three months later, recaptured it. He did. Mm -hmm. Four months after that, recaptured it again. Wow. So I'm not sure if he knew there was a free meal involved. <laughs> All right. <laughs> When we're talking about tagging fish, one of the things that I know that y'all are looking at is how fast fish reproduce. What fish is the fastest when it comes to reproducing? Well, as far as reproduction goes, um, you know, I'm not necessarily sure it's the fastest, but uh, one of the, like I said, one of our most important is spotted sea trout. Um, so they can actually reach maturity in the first year and be able to spawn within the first year of life. Um, and they spawn from about mid-April through September. And once spawning season begins, they can actually spawn every two to seven days. Wow. How else can people get involved besides eliminating the carcasses? What can they do? Well, definitely um, reach out to the the tagging program will be another great way to, um, to do that. And it's always fun to, to hear that your fish got recaptured and to know that it's still continuing to um, gather information because a lot of the anglers that I deal with don't take the fish. They actually like to release really that tag so that you get multiple recaptures. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get movement from that and also we'll get growth. So when, when you tag it the first time, somebody tags it the first time, they take a measurement. And then when it's recaptured, the next person takes a measurement. So we're, we're able to look at the growth rates in between that time frame too. Or bad measurements. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> that happens in construction. All right, so thank you so much for watching Coast Fest, the virtual edition. Now we want you to get involved too. So what we would like for you to do is go to Facebook or YouTube and ask questions. We're going to sit here for a while and uh, find out what's on your mind and uh, ask the questions and get some answers. So uh, feel free to do that. Uh, how did y'all get in this job? It's a cool job. How did you get involved with it? Um, I'll start. So I've always been obsessed with fishing. Um, I went to school to actually learn how to become a better fisherman. Um, it, honestly, it didn't work. Uh, but after I went to the University of Georgia, go dogs. After uh, UGA, I began working with them with their sturgeon research up in Darien, Georgia. Um, I was doing gill netting for sturgeon, and all of a sudden a job became available here for gill netting in the Altamaha River, and that's something I'd already been doing. Um, so I kind of, kind of lucked out, got in here, um, fell in love here, and I've been here ever since. So how'd you get involved? Yeah, so um, I actually am born and raised here in Brunswick, Georgia. I grew up um, on a shrimp boat. My dad's family are shrimpers. My mom's family owned the fish market. So I, I guess I kind of cheated a little bit, but I knew ever since the seventh grade that that's what I wanted to do with being a marine biologist. So I decided to go to Savannah State University for my bachelor's degree. And before I even graduated, um, we went to a, a field trip on the RV Anna before the RV um, Breed Harris. And we did a little field trip, and I kind of got talking to some of the, the mates and really interested in the job here. And later on, something opened up, and they gave me a call and asked me if I wanted to apply. And I applied and got the job, and um, I started off on the krill project and then started doing some netting project mm -hmm. as well. And then I kind of morphed over into the aging lab and the long line project. Great. Yeah. Thank you all. Let's go back to sturgeons for a minute, because I'm fascinated by the sturgeon <laughs> fish. It's... A prehistoric fish. It correct? is. It is. It is. And uh, we have two types of species here in Georgia. We have the short-nosed sturgeon, 
Um, and then we have the Atlantic sturgeon. The Atlantic sturgeon can grow massive. Um, if you're ever in some of our uh, sounds near the rivers um, during the summer months, you'll probably see them jump out of the water. Mm -hmm. But they're just very interesting fish. And that is a protected species. Both yes, them, right? both, both species are protected. All right. So y'all have done some cool stuff. Do you get to go out and, and jump in the water and hang out with the fish occasionally and do some scuba diving? Is that part of your job occasionally? We do get to yes, scuba dive occasionally, yes, on some of our artificial reefs offshore. All right. So you get to fish and sh uh, swim with the sharks. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Any unnerving events happen then? I can't say that no. I've had any unnerving events, no. but I'll Thankfully. take you some places. Thank, yeah. <laughs> All right, so if you've got some questions, still got some time, Facebook or YouTube, and uh, just go to that, and you'll find us. It's Virtual Coast Fest 2021. Once again, thank you to all the folks, the kids that uh, did a wonderful job with the art projects. This is from St. Francis Xavier and also Needwood Middle School. Now, we were set to do again this year an art contest and because of COVID they put a stop to it and they said okay we're not going to be able to do that but these two schools had already committed and the kids did something so we decided you know what let's make this part of the set and I'm glad we did because this really adds a lot of color and a little spice to our look today now one of the questions that just came in they want to know where is your co-host Robbie Sue from 1041 The Way well, Robbie Sue did a belly flop into the touch tank and the authorities are here and they're trying to sort that out so she won't be joining us anytime soon. So uh, I guess that's the last of our questions. Do we have any more? Um, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, thank that's you. That's all the time we're going to do for this session. Uh, Ryan, Donna, thank you for the great information on the Aging Growth Lab. And thank you all for joining us. And we'll be back at 2.15 this afternoon with more of Coast Fest, the virtual edition.